Hi there, eToro. It is Monday the 17th of April, and that means it's time to take a look at what moved the markets last week. Despite Monday being a holiday for much of the Western world, we still saw a week jam-packed with very interesting macro data goings on. Probably the most watched data set for the week were the CPI numbers out of the US. The core number came in in line with expectations, but the uh, headline numbers were actually lower than expected. This now means that inflation is not only trending down, but this was a surprise to the downside, at least in terms of US inflation. This downtrend was then supported by the PPI number that we got on Thursday, which was significantly lower than analysts had expected. They had thought that there would be a slight increase in PPI. However, it dropped by half a percent. For those of you that don't know, the PPI number tends to be a leading number for CPI. So PPI is the inflation that is seen by companies that make things in an economy. And those prices, whether they're going up or coming down, usually feed through to the consumer later on. And we see that feed through as the CPI number. This drop in inflation is good for businesses. It's good for people. I'm sure the Fed is very happy about it. However, there is a flip side to this coin. The flip side, of course, is that in order to bring prices down, there needs to be some form of demand destruction within an economy. And we have evidence of this in some data points that we saw last week. So the initial jobless claims came in higher than expected. This type of upside surprise in initial jobless claims hasn't happened very frequently through the past year. And on top of this, we got uh, retail sales numbers out of the US on Friday, which came in much weaker than analysts had expected. Now this two-sided coin, one side falling inflation, the other side falling economic growth, is the reason that the market is having trouble picking a direction. And we've seen the S&P 500, for example, cross over the 200-day moving average several times through this year. And I kind of expect this to continue through the rest of this year. Other interesting data points that we saw, uh, well, uh, German CPI came in uh, on the nose. And GDP within the UK, it's not obvious from the numbers that you have on screen, uh, was stronger than many were expecting. This is a surprise for a few reasons. I think in the UK, people tend to be a little bit more pessimistic than they do within the US. It's just a cultural thing. But this is not the only reason. The UK has seen a large number of strikes, which obviously would have disrupted productivity. And despite this, GDP still seems fairly solid within the UK. I also wanted to talk briefly about bond yields and the yield curve. I think that this is something that we've seen a lot of in the media. The yield curve has been inverted for quite a long time, and the yield curve is a fairly accurate predictor of a coming recession, or at least a very strong slowdown in growth. Now I'm gonna to have to give you a quick primer on bonds. Hopefully you have some baseline understanding, uh, but a bond, in this case, a US treasury, so a bond that you can buy from the government, is a loan that you give to the government and that loan earns interest over a certain duration. Now you can lend the government money over various periods from a few years to several decades. Now in normal times, you would expect that the longer you are lending that money out, the higher the return you would expect. And in fact, a normal yield curve does look like that. So for example, on screen, you can see what is a normal yield curve. So the longer the maturity of the bond, the higher the yield, the higher the interest earned. However, during times of economic uncertainty, uh, that curve tends to invert so that the yield on shorter term bonds is higher than the yield on longer term bonds. Now, there are various reasons that the yield curve can invert. And uh, to some degree, it is determined by the current economic conditions. Now on screen, the weird looking curve that you see is the yield curve as it stands right now. So you can see that on the far left, the shorter term bonds, those that are a few months to a couple of years, uh, give you a much higher yield than those on the far right. And so this weird looking curve is inverted. Now the reason for the inversion at the moment is that interest rates are very high. However, the thinking is that with falling inflation, interest rates will come down. And if interest rates come down, then the yields on bonds uh, a few years out to a few decades out will fall too. Now, given what we've seen recently in terms of macro data points, some of which I just discussed, I wanted to start hedging my portfolio in case there is a large scale drop in economic activity. 
In other words, if we do see a recession, the relationship between a bond's yield and the price of a bond are inverse. This means that if you were to buy a bond today and the yield of that particular bond starts to drop, then the corresponding price of that bond increases. So the way that I've chosen to participate in this activity that I expect within the bond market is to take a position in this particular ETF. What's very obvious from what you can see on screen is that during the period of the coronavirus crash, when rates went to just about zero, uh, the prices of these bonds skyrocketed. Conversely, as rates have risen, and you can see the action being most dramatic in the past uh, two years or so, the prices of these bonds have dropped. So the yields have increased and the price of the bonds have dropped. Why have I chosen this particular duration? Well, historically speaking, when there is an impending economic slowdown coming or a recession, it tends to be bonds within this particular period that do quite well. I think that this will end up being a fairly low risk trade. It's not the usual thing that I do. I tend to invest in companies and hold for the long term, but I think that holding bonds of this particular duration will be better than holding cash, particularly if the economy ends up being a lot weaker than everyone hopes for. Something else we saw towards the tail end of last week an event that I was particularly interested in was JP Morgan Chase's earnings report. The reason that I was very interested in this is because with the turmoil in the banking industry, JP Morgan Chase is likely to have seen a huge inflow of customer deposits. The bank did so well that the EPS number came in at $4.10, exceeding the average analyst estimate of $3.41. This is a huge beat, particularly given the economic situation that we have at the moment. Their outlook for 2023 was also very, very strong, although the CEO did try to temper the optimism a little bit, saying that there is a chance that the banking turmoil that we've seen very recently with SVB and other banks uh, could create challenges in the near term future. And the final set of data points that I want to talk about from last week are those concerning uh, China's economy. We saw Chinese inflation come in quite a lot lower than what was expected. There's been an enormous demand destruction within the Chinese economy. They, of course, had those enormous multi-year lockdowns. Um, they rolled out new regulation legislation that crippled uh, temporarily a large part of their industries. The real estate market has obviously collapsed. And so you would expect inflation in China to be fairly low, given that they've basically gone through their own 2008 great financial crisis. However, within China, we are starting to see the first few green shoots of economic growth once again. And a very low inflation rate means that the government can continue to push the pedal to the metal in order to stimulate that growth. Now, I have thrown up this chart before, and I believe that China's economy, as well as their stock markets and various other asset classes, have been in a stage four decline for some time now, a year and a half, two years at least, and potentially in the beginnings of stage one the accumulation phase. For those of you that haven't been through large-scale market collapses before, it can take quite a long time for confidence to return to a market. And I believe this is what we're seeing within the Chinese economy right now. However, we're also starting to get some very interesting evidence about how strong China's economic recovery is likely to be. One such data point from last week were Chinese exports, and they were expected by some to decline by 7%. Instead, China posted growth of 15% in March. This is just one data point that the trend of a slowing, weak economy within China is beginning to reverse. So how did these various events play out within the stock market? Well, within the CSI 300, which many think of as the SP 500 out of China, the market was fairly flat on the week. Within the NASDAQ 100 from Friday to Friday last, uh, fairly flat on the week too, whereas the SP 500 saw a nice little jump towards the tail end of last week, potentially propelled uh, by those fantastic earnings by JP Morgan. In terms of this week, it's a fairly quiet week in terms of macro data out of the US, although uh, people will be watching the initial jobless claims number that we see on Thursday. However, around the world, there are some very important numbers coming out. So for China, we're gonna get the GDP number. Within the UK, as well as the EU region, we're getting the CPI numbers, the inflation numbers on Wednesday. 
And from the UK, we're going to learn more about retail sales in March, as well as the PMI numbers, which tend to be a leading indicator of economic strength. Now, the lack of economic data out of the US doesn't mean that it's gonna be a quiet week at all. Everyone's gonna be laser focused on earnings through this week. There are a number of interesting companies that will be reporting earnings. From my portfolio, I believe Netflix and TSM will be reporting. So I'll be following those closely, of course. But we'll also be seeing the numbers from some very heavy hitters, including the US banks and Tesla through this week. All right, that's it from me. I hope you have a good week. Goodbye.